Why can't we believe it today? Not believing superstitiously in the magic of words. Not believing ignorantly in some music ghostly ideas. Not believing with being sharp belief. The eternal God is not hidden in clouds, but is accessible to the human heart forever faith. That ought to transform. All right, good evening. Uh, glad that you're here at Theology on Fire. Uh, this is our fourth installment, as uh, Paul was saying. And, you know, I don't know, you know where you've been at today and where your mind space is, but this is super important. Uh, we're going to come and learn about, about God through his word. Uh, and what you think about God, uh, what you believe about God, is, is, is the most important thing about you. Uh, what you believe about Jesus, <laughs> what you believe about Jesus uh, and confess with your mouth, um, who he is and what he's done for you, that surrender changes your eternity. So this is significant things we're talking about. We're going to look at the person of, of Jesus Christ um, this evening. And so if you haven't been here, you can catch them all. Uh, they're online, and uh, we've, we've done it at both campuses. Uh, and we, what we're doing is we're framing the biblical narrative um, of how God reveals himself, but also the biblical narrative of of salvation. And so when we look at this, we, we started with God speaks. And so we talked about general revelation, special re- revelation, like God speaks. He is, he's communicating to us. God is a speaking God. He speaks that in creation. He speaks that through his word. He speaks that uh, through, through the spirit of God. God speaks to us. And uh, we looked as God speaks. So really the creation, so God created um, how do we know who God is? Well, he tells us. God speaks to us through his word who he is. So we don't have to wonder uh, who God is. He's, he clearly communicates uh, who he is. Uh, then we looked at who God is, which is Trinity. God is one in three persons. This is how God reveals himself. There's one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And then we talked about the Trinity. Then we looked at humanity uh, last week. And so humanity, we're made in the image and likeness of God with dignity, value, and worth. Um, to reflect his glory. But we looked at Genesis 3, and through Genesis 3, we found out uh, you know, sin, uh, humanity sinned against God, rebelled against God, and now uh, we have a fractured relationship with God, uh, ourselves, and uh, creation. Everything is marred. We talked a little bit about total depravity, how it affects every facet and faculty of, of who we are, our mind, will, um, our spirit, our, our relationships. It, it, we are totally depraved. It doesn't mean we're bad as we could be, it means that, man, we are totally um, not how we should be. Um, and with that being said, that's a big problem. We, what I just said was we are cut off from the author of life because of sin. We have rebelled against God, and therefore we sin under condemnation, the judgment of God. Uh, we'll look at it. It says, I mean, if you eat the, the, the tree that he told him not to eat of, you're surely going to die. That death comes in. Why? Because of sin. And so there's a real problem that all of us face, and there's only one remedy, and that is the, the person and work of the second person of the Trinity, which is Jesus Christ. So it's a huge deal. Like, there is, <laughs> I heard John Piper once say that there, the, the, the world is a, conv- it's a conveyor belt of death. So what that means, you're just moving along <laughs> unto your death. And everyone experiences that, uh, and, and as you're younger, you're like, ah, oh, that's not going to happen to me. But as you get older and you start to hurt or you, you start to experience life, like, you know it's coming. And Jesus is the remedy. He's the eternal life. And this is why we love to talk about Jesus here. If you come to the Door Church, what you're going to hear a lot about is Jesus. Um, because that is the hero or one of our, our story. That's what I hope this evening, that we would see maybe for the first time or the millionth time that Jesus is the hero of your story uh, he's the centerpiece. Not only did he create, and we talked about, but he's the centerpiece of history. Even timelines are, are molded around him before Jesus and after Jesus, uh, his, his birth. Um, he's the centerpiece of Scripture. If you have time, go read Luke 24. It'll just tell you how all the Psalms, the prophets, all the Scriptures about who Jesus. You know who said that? Jesus. Jesus saying, all this is actually about me. So we love to make much of Jesus because he's the the way, the truth, and the life, and it's the only way that we can be reconciled 
uh, to God. So we're going to look at this evening, Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? The second person of the Trinity. That's why we're double clicking on Jesus. Father sent the Son. You know who loves, loves to make much of the Son is the Spirit of God. The only way that we believe in Jesus is by the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. So we want to exalt Jesus. And as we exalt Jesus, we believe God, the Holy Spirit, draws people to himself and gives us um, insight and belief to see who Jesus is. All right. So what we're going to look at in particular about Jesus is the incarnation. So we talked about Jesus um, in, in, when we talked about the Trinity, but what we're going to look at is the incarnation of Jesus. This is, this is why we celebrate Christmas. <laughs> this is the Christmas story. God became man and dwelt among us. Now, this is mind-blowing, but if you come every Christmas, you're like, well, yeah, 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 Jesus was born. No, this is mind-blowing that God became man and dwelt among us. And we're going to talk about why and actually what he accomplished, but uh, the reason why God became man, I've heard it said, said several ways, is uh, yes, God speaks, but he spoke, you know who he speaks most clearly through is Jesus. If you see, if you see Jesus, you'll see the Father. Uh, he's the exact imprint of, of the Father. And so this idea is the best way we can know God is Jesus, because Jesus is God. We'll get into that. But he accommodates us and meets us where we're at. Uh, the incarnation, God becoming man and dwelling among us, is an accommodation. It's meeting us at our point, or, our, our, in our limitations, uh, at our point of need. It's it's um, it's it's like a, a parent stooping to the point of a child so they can understand. Um, it's willingly to slow down, to limit, so to speak, yourself, so you can help uh, the child uh, to grow. And that's that's the purpose of of Christ. He's accommodating us, sinful humanity. Uh, lowly humanity. We'll talk more about that. So the incarnation of Christ, um, the second person of the Trinity did become man in human his history. Uh, we call this the God-man. Jesus is the God-man. He's not the man that became God. That's a false doctrine. Some people believe that he's the God, he's, he's the eternal God who became man. We'll, we'll talk about a few times as God did not become less than God. He added to his divinity humanity. So it's not um, I'm not even trying to do the math problem in addition by subtraction, that type of thing. But God who is God, and he added to himself humanity. He didn't become less God. He still is God, and he added to his divinity humanity. Um, what I want to look at is briefly is just the incarnation uh, in Scripture, God becoming man. John 1, 1 through 4, we'll just start there. It's a very familiar verse. It's a very helpful verse. Um, it's a go-to point of uh, the incarnation, uh, God becoming man. It says, in the beginning, so if we just take that out, in the beginning is what? That's, that's, that's language of what? We, we just went through it uh, this Sunday. In the beginning is the book of the beginnings. It's referring to Genesis. So it's talking about from eternity past. In the beginning was, was the word. So this is, he's always been. Uh, it's saying in the beginning was the word. So outside of time, uh, in space, what was the word? It always was. Uh, it's talking about um, eternity there, um, preeminent, prominent. In the beginning was who? The word, and the word was with God. The with is this idea as he's, he, he was face to face with God. So who is the word? We find out later. Don't move it on, but uh, the word became flesh and among us, only, uh, the only son from the Father who is full in grace and truth, which is Jesus. What it's saying is uh, Jesus um, is with God. And we talked about that last week, but before, before creation, God existed and he was, he was constant and he was a community within himself. And it's, it's actually communicating the Trinity even here. Jesus was what? With God. He was face to face in friendship with God, and the Word was God. This is a claim that Jesus is God. He was in the beginning uh, with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Uh, and then it talks about, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This Word, this, the second person of Trinity, became flesh and dwelt among us. Um, the incarnation has, has always been the plan. So we talked about God, and he created humanity. We made him upright. We rebelled against God, so we are not, we're not righteous. We're not upright. We are sinful. We have a problem, namely, we, we don't love God. We don't love humanity. We're about ourselves, and 
the wages of sin is death. We're on a trajectory of decay and eternal damnation. That's a huge problem, but God always had a plan. It talks about actually in Ephesians, before the foundation of the world, he had a plan. But we see that plan show up as soon as Genesis 3, when sinful humanity, or Adam and Eve rebelled against God, and uh, sin entered the world, namely our hearts, and spread to every person that's ever lived. Um, God had a plan, and it's always been the same plan. And that was to send his son to deal with our, uh, with our sin um, and, and, and reconcile us to the Father. So what I want to look at is the plan, Jesus' incarnation foretold. This has always been the plan that God would become man and dwell among us, that, that Jesus would come. This has always been the plan. Genesis 3.15, so as soon as we sin, this is called the Proto-Evangelion, the first gospel. We sin, God proclaims, man, I'm, I'm coming on a rescue plan, namely through the Son of the son of a woman. I will put enmity between you and the woman and the between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the idea of Jesus battling, send Satan to death, Satan. He's going to bruise, uh, he's going to crush Satan's head. It's going to bruise uh, the, 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 the son's heel. What's interesting, this is even foretelling to a certain extent um, that, that, that a little bit of, of the virgin birth, but the idea of that, that, that God would, would enter the world and do, you know, uh, deal with uh, Satan through a woman. Now, what's interesting, it doesn't talk about man here. Almost every time in Scripture it talks about the lineage of man. There's no lineage of man here. It's talking about the, through the woman. So there's, there's almost by the absence of stating a lineage of a man, it's, it's whispering uh, a virgin birth, that, that somehow God would use the woman in the birth of a son to deal with with our sin. Isaiah 7:14 gives more clarity to that. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, behold the virgin what shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So we get more clarity about this 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 seed of a woman that would come. It's going to come through a young virgin. Um it goes on to say the birthplace of 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 Jesus would be uh in uh, Micah 5:2. It'll be up on the screen. But you, O Bethlehem, and I practice this effort that. I think I killed it. Uh, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, who, who coming forth is from old of ancient of days. What's so interesting here is that we know Jesus was born in Bethlehem. You know, that's not the spoiler alert. Uh, but that's, that's because uh, his father, his adopted father, his lineage was there, and they're doing taxes and a census, and they, they were sent there for him to be born there. It was so interesting. This is not a major town. Do you know how prophetic this is? It's like being born in Pilot Point. Like, that's not showing up on the radar. If you put Jerusalem or Rome, that makes a little bit of sense. But the, the nuance and the particularity of saying he's going to be born in Bethlehem is amazing because this is the plan. It's giving clarity of who we'd be looking for. Uh, why, and we'll get to this, there's, there's always been the why. Some people get confused. Why did God become man? Some people believe that. They're like, oh, yeah, God became man. Well, why did he come? We well, wanted a good example. We'll talk more about it at the end. He came to be a savior, to deal with our sin, to die in our stead. Isaiah 53, 1 through 12, it says this. It's quite a bit. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no former majesty that we should look like him. So if you're wondering what Jesus, you know, looked like, he wasn't it says in no beauty. It wasn't beautiful. It's not what you think. He was very ordinary, very human-like, that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs. He borne our, our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, so God's desire was to crush him. We'll do that, but he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that what brought us peace. We have a problem with God, namely that we're rebellions and we have the wrath of God placed on him, but he brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord what laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his, for his generation, who considered that he was cut, cut, cut off out of the land of the living? 
the, the, the cross, cut, cut out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Uh, we don't have time to get in that, but he was buried in a rich man's tomb. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, uh, he shall see his offspring he shall prolong his days, and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of the soul, he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall the righteous one, my servant, make, listen, the righteous one, make my servant many, make many to be accounted as righteous. Accounted as righteous. That's our hope. And he shall bear their iniquities. It was very clear of why Jesus was going to come. He's coming to die in our stead, to deal with our, 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 our sin problem, our death problem, to bring us peace with God, to bear, to bear our transgressions, uh, to make us righteous who are unrighteous. It's really amazing to see uh, the incarnation foretold. Uh, I, I put one verse just for the New Testament. Even the New Testament writers speak, the prophets, people, they understood a Messiah was coming. Uh, they understood they were looking for uh, this to come, First Peter 1.10, one of my favorite things, uh, and that, that, really that first chapter, concerning this salvation, like they're looking for this, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, what, searched and inquired carefully, um, it actually goes on to say the scriptures, I didn't put all of them in, the scriptures, to look at the time that, that he, he would come. Um, the, I, the idea there is we, we've been waiting on on. God becoming man and dealing with what we cannot deal with. Now, again, Jesus was fully God. So the second, the second person coming into uh, humanity, God, God added to his divinity, humanity. But Jesus was fully God and never ceased to be God. This is important because a lot of people are like, well, you know, Jesus was, he was he, yes, he, he was alive. But he, was, he was a good person. Or um, like I said, other people believe that he was a man that had kind of acquired God's status. no. Everyone, there's so many claims that he was God throughout, but I'll just name a few of the claims that Jesus claimed to be God. Uh, Hebrews 1.8, it says this, But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So God the Father is saying, The Son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The, the scepter of your upright, uh, uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. And the Father said that Jesus was God. Uh, the demonic... Demons recognized that Jesus was God in Luke 4, 41. It says this, And the demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was a Christ. So some people missed on who, uh, who the Son of God was. The demons got it right. They understood this is, this is God. He's the creator and sustainer of everyone and everything. Uh, furthermore, what Jesus says is amazing in John 8, 58 and 59. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham, before Abraham was, I am. Now he's talking to the Pharisees there and some religious leaders. Before Abraham, uh, I am. Now that's incredible. He's using the one. He's, he's referring to their lineage of faith, which is like, oh, we're from the line of Abraham. He's like, yeah, before that, before your foundation, I am. I, I am God. He's talking to you. I'm eternal. That was mind-blowing to them because they knew exactly what he was saying. He was taking the name of God uh, on himself. Um, furthermore, um, his, his disciples claimed that Jesus was God in John 20, 28. Uh, Thomas answered him, my Lord and what? My God. He didn't correct him. He said, no, you got it right. This is post-resurrection. My Lord and my God. That is a, that is a profession of faith. That's a beautiful thing. My Lord and my God. Um, I hope, pray that that would all come into our hearts and mind this evening. Um, man, I, I love that someone who walked and talked with Jesus, disciple, doubted him to a certain degree. <laughs> God said, that, that's my Lord, my God. You know how powerful that is? Uh, there's no one in the world, even close, that could get me to, to utter those words. Not, not even close. My Lord and my God. Know why? Because I know them. Every, and, and you know me, right? But he knew and walked with Jesus enough and saw what he did. like, my Lord and my God. That's incredible testimony to me uh, from someone that, that had some doubts and went to saying, no, th this, is, this is, he had, he had no, he had, he had no point in his life. It was like, well, remember when he did that? I, I mean, I could do that with people. You can do that with me. He's like, remember he did that? That's kind of, it was a little goofy. There's none of that for him. It's just, he's my Lord, my God. His resume 
uh, was perfect. And that's a really powerful statement by Thomas. Jesus claims uh, to be God, and that's what got him killed. I went to a church one time visiting. He's like, yeah, Jesus, he, he was more of like a political thing. He just kind of happened up on the cross. And, didn't, and I was like, no, this is crazy. Jesus, the reason why he got crucified, he kept on saying he was God, <laughs> and they didn't like it. Uh, Matthew 26, 63 through 65, but Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you're the Christ, the son of God. Listen to why they got so angry. And Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you from now on, you will see the son of man seated. And that's a term of God uh, going back to, uh, I think it's Daniel. The son of man seated at the right hand of power. So he's using name, he's naming uh, the, the Messiah to come. At the right hand of power coming on the clouds of heaven. And then listen to this. The high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered what? Blasphemy. And he's saying he's, he's, he keeps on saying he's God. What further witness do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. Um, so Jesus claimed to be God, and that is what got him killed. Um, in John 5, 17, it says this, but Jesus answered them, my, my father is working until now and I am working. But listen to this. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. Jesus saw that he is God and that made him very upset. Um, in the internal God, um, Revelation 22, verse 13 is pretty powerful. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. This, this is Jesus saying, I'm, 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 I'm eternal God. Um, he did God things. So not only did he claim to be God, he did God things. <laughs> and so uh, he has the attributes of God, the characters of God. He demonstrated his God, Godness throughout, uh, throughout his life. First Peter 2, 22, it says this, he committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. The sinless savior died. Going back to Thomas, there's nothing flawed on his resume. Like he, he only uh, was full of grace and truth, and, and he is righteous. Um, he's without sin. Luke 7, 48, but he did forgive sin. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Now, uh, in Scripture, we sin first and foremost against God. Every sin that we ever commit horizontally or with our spouse, our kids, or neighbor, or whatever, it's first and foremost against God. You're not obeying uh, his, his, his desires, commands. Uh, and then we certainly hurt other people. But the reason why only God can forgive sins, because that's who it's primarily against. When, 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 when David sinned, and he had quite the sin of chasing another, another woman, and, and killing off her husband, he says, first and foremost, I sinned against you, God. Well, he sinned against a lot of people at that point, but why do he say I sinned against you, God, alone? Why? Because ultimately, the one that needs to forgive us of sins, we need forgiveness of others, but it's primarily God, because that's who we primarily sin against, and Jesus says, I forgive sins. John 6, uh, 39 through 40, uh, 44, I don't think we all know 44, but I'll probably just stop here, is Jesus did God things, and this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Listen to this. For this is the will of my father, that everyone who looks on the son and believes in him should what have eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. So Jesus says, I'll give eternal life, and I, I'm able to, to bring resurrection. Uh, that's what God does. John 5, 22, verse 23, Jesus says this, For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all, my honor, uh, that, may, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So it's talking about uh, this idea that, that, that Jesus is able to, to judge. Um, he's the true judge. He's the rightful judge. Um, he grants eternal life in John 10, 28. It says, I give them eternal life. Only God can do that. In John 5, 23, he says that he can be worshipped and honored, that all, all, that all may honor the Son just as they had honored my Father. He says he, he should be worshipped. Now, the Ten Commandments says, says that you should have no other gods before me, that we should only worship God. And Jesus said, no, you, you should worship me. Why? Because he's saying, I am God. I'm, I'm deserving of honor and worship. So Jesus is fully God, and Jesus is fully man. Jesus is fully God and he's fully man. 
I don't always think we, we think about this, but I think we should. I know we should, because the Bible tells us to. But you guys look at Christmas, you, you think you think he was born of a baby. I mean, it's just a, such a humble, humble position and posture that God comes in. God, God comes humbly to us. But um, he had a human body, Romans 8, 3. It says this, For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sin, not likeness, <laughs> the sameness of our sinful flesh, then the idea is that we, he has flesh and that for sin he condemned sin in the flesh. He, the incarnation is he took on flesh and blood. Um, what's interesting, and I took one of the verses out, Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, it talks about his genealogy, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's a fantastic thing to read through. He had a genealogy uh, pointing about, man, he's the fulfillment of the Messiah and the, the promise um, the promised blessing uh, and seed to to Abraham, but that also means he had grandparents and he had, you know, mom. He 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 had a dad. He had brothers and sisters. He had, he, he was human. He had a family, a human family. He came from a line. Um, he was born of a woman. Luke two seven, and it says, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no place for him in the inn. Um, he, he, he experienced birth. Um, he grew, I just wrote down here, we'll read all, all, all at once. He grew physically uh, in stature. He grew in his mental abilities and capabilities. He grew spiritually, socially, experienced fatigue. He got tired. It says in Luke 2.42, this, and when he was 12 years old, uh, they went up according to a custom, so he grew in age. He just wasn't 33-year-old Jesus uh, right away. Luke 2:52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. So he grew in stature, he grew in spiritually. Uh, in Luke 3:23, it talks about Jesus when he began his ministry was about 13 years of age, being the son, as he was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli. Um, he grew in just a, a social aspect, uh, and he experienced fatigue. He got tired. Matthew eight twenty four. It says, uh, "And behold, there he there rose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. Je- you know, uh, Jesus took naps. Like I actually fell asleep in my truck today, not on purpose. Know why? Because I was tired. That that's Jesus experienced these types of things. He experienced uh, fatigue." He's able to empathize in every way with us because of this. Um, I have Mark 4.38. I already got that one. He, he, he slept. Um, we can go up there. Mark 4.38, the slurm, uh, the stern of the ship. Um, smart guy. You like a cushioned pillow. Um, we keep going. He was hungry. Um, even post-resurrection, he ate with the disciples. But... Um, and after fasting for three days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Um, he, he ate. He had to have food to sustain him. He had a job, Mark 6, 3. It talks about him being a carpenter. Uh, he had friends, John 11 through uh, 11, 3 through 5. It talks about, uh, so the sisters went into him saying, Lord, he, uh, he whom you love is, is ill. Um, so the idea is, man, he had friends that he loved, but when Jesus heard it, he said, this is the illness that not, does not lead to death. It's for the glory of God, so the Son of, May, uh, the Son of God may be glorified through it. Uh, now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. He had deep friendships. Um, let's see here. Um, he went to parties. Matthew eleven nineteen. it says this. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they said, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet... Uh, yet wisdom is just as he, 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 he was a fun person to hang out with. He actually got invited to places and he said yes. And I think that's super interesting. He experienced grief, Luke 19, 41. It talks about, and when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. He had deep grief over people's plights, particularly his creation. Mark 1, 41, it talks about moves with pity. He stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. He, he has compassion. Uh, in John 13, 21, it talks about stress. And after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in spirit. He was troubled in spirit. He was, you know, I'd even say a little bit of anxiety and testified truly. I say to you, one of you will, will betray me. Um, it talks about uh, and happiness. Um, I think I took that one out. John 5, yeah, no, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. He was full of joy and happiness. One I didn't write down, uh, it talked about he bled. 
course, on the cross, but it, he, he sweat blood. He, he felt pain. Um, he wept. John 11, I said, and where, uh, and he said, where have you laid him? As he lost a friend, they said to him, Lord, come see. And Jesus, he wept. He knows what it's like to lose a loved one. So in summary of God, the second person, uh, the incarnation becoming man, is Ju- Jesus is fully God and fully man. He's fully God and fully man. Um, they call this the, the hypostatic union. Um, that doesn't mean the, kind of the theological definitions. There's no mixture and intermingling of the nature of God and man, although the two natures are in one person. So God became man. He added to his divinity humanity. And actually, post-resurrection, he's still the God-man. And he still identifies with humanity and praise God for that. We'll talk about a little bit why that's so important. Um, I'm going to read Philippians 2, 5 through 11. It talks about this, the incarnation. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus. That's probably my favorite, one of my favorite scriptures. Have this mind among yourself. God wants us to think like Jesus, to have the mind of Christ. Um, who, is, who, though he was in the form of God. This means the exact substance. He, what it's saying is Jesus is God. Did not count a call to God a thing to be grasped. He didn't hold on to his position of honor, of being, <laughs> uh, he added the, uh, humanity to his um, humanity, but he's the king of kings. He deserved worship, but he set that aside. It says, but he entered himself. So he, he was willing to be scorned and humbled um, for, for us by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, that's putting on human flesh, and being found in human form, he humbles himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. It gets very clear of why he came to death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him uh, the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This, this is who Jesus is. And when, he, when we talk about the incarnation, he came and he humbled himself. He became a servant, obedient to death, death on a cross. He, he defeated sin, saying the death. He, he, he rose from the grave and it says that every knee shall bow. He is the King of kings and... Um, it is interesting to say that every knee shall bow. It's not like some will bow, some won't. You will bow. You will bow in salvation or you will bow your knee and, uh, and you'll receive co- uh, condemnation depending on when, when you surrender to Christ. You will surrender. It's not if, but when. On this, on this side uh, of, of, of your death or, or, or the other side, one, one will be to eternal life and one will be to eternal damnation, but you will bow before this king. Uh, and the question is, is timing and your eternity uh, is at stake depending on on how you respond to him coming for you. Now, I, brief, I mentioned it there. Why, how much have I got? I got two minutes. All right. Why the incarnation of Jesus Christ? This is super important. Super important is actually one of our, our, our points in membership is we want to be missional. Incarnational is a word you could use. Why? Why do we want to be that? Because Jesus is that. Like, when so many people are like, hey, you should do something, I usually say, no, you should do something when they're called to ministry. Not that if it doesn't tell with our mission or DNA, like this bracelet I'm wearing, someone's idea, not mine. It's like, oh, that seems to be real fit in with prayer, and we want to pray for our students. It's it's not that we don't want to do anything, but God has called you to live a missional life, uh, to seek and save the lost by proclaiming the good news of Jesus. So my point here, why the incarnation? God was on a pursuit, a mission. You are his mission to save you, to rescue you. And if you experience that rescue, why would you not join him on that mission to proclaim um, who, who Jesus is and what he's done? And so many people are living for such sub, uh, what's the right word? Meaningless missions, and you know it. Uh, when you join in the mission of God and living mission on pursuing to bring the good news to the broken, the hurting, and the poor, and the sinners, uh, it gives you great joy because you know it, it has eternal value. And you can. And that doesn't mean you go on missions overseas. Maybe it does, but that means you live missionally where God puts you. Do you know how many places God's, God's put you? This is your neighbors. This is, uh, this is your friends' families. These, these are your, your, kid, your kids' friends. Like You're there to bring Christ to them. 
if you just open your eyes to see what Christ has come to you. Um, the purpose of the incarnation, I got to go very quickly, um, was, was grace and truth. John, John 1, 14, it says this, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the father, what full and grace and truth. The reason why Jesus came, hear me, he wants to bring you grace. He wants to bring you grace. He's going to tell you the truth, that you're, you're sinful and you should die, but he, he, he died in your stead. Full of grace and truth. You ever wonder what God wants for you? He wants grace for you. How do we know that? Jesus came. If you ever wonder what God wants for you, you don't have to wonder why, because Jesus came. He said he's full of grace and truth. He came on a rescue plan for you. How powerful is that? We don't have to wonder what God, how God, God feels. He wants, he wants grace for us. Um, another purpose of the incarnation, um, it says in Luke 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man, what he came, he came to seek to save the lost. The only people he's not going to save, the people that don't admit that they need the salvation. So the way that you come to salvation is like, oh, I need that. And God provides the grace. He gives, he gives the gift. We've got to open our, our hands to receive the gifts that we are lost. But in Christ, we can be found. He's on a mission to, to save you, uh, to seek and save the lost. Now, he came to die in our stead. We, we read that already in Isaiah 53 and, and, and Philippians 2. Um, penal, substitu- penal substitutionary atonement is a fun theological word, but he died in our stead. He, it's his, his life or our life. Some people look at Jesus like, oh, he's a good example. He's a good teacher. And Well, sure. But primarily, he came on a rescue plan to die in your stead. He is a substitute. Me and you need, we need a substitute to die in our stead because the wages of sin is death. Someone has to pay for our sin. Someone, you have a debt between us and God, and someone has to pay. You will pay for eternity, or you can trust that Jesus satisfied the wrath of God by dying in our stead. Uh, it's, it's the central piece to the Christian faith. You can, if you don't believe in the substitutionary death of Christ, you're not a Christian. Because this is the centerpiece of what makes us right with God is his life for our life. Someone has to pay. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, no one is righteous, not one. There's not one person on the entire earth that is righteous. So we, we all have a problem. When you serve a righteous, holy God, we are not. So we have a problem. Uh, everyone deserves death. The Genesis 2.17, it says this, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat from the day that you eat of it. You shall surely die. <laughs> we are dying. Why? Because we've rebelled against God. Uh, furthermore, Romans 6, it says the wages of sin is death. We'll get there in a second. Revelation 21, verse 8, uh, everyone deserves hell and the second death. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, because <laughs> I think some people are like, well, you know, I'm not a murderer, you know, I don't think I do sorcery. I'm pretty good. This is all liars. <laughs> so like everyone's a liar and everyone ha- is frankly cowardly. They don't obey God. There's a sin of omission of not obeying. So w- listen what they should get. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. That's what we deserve. Why? Because of our sin. You know, it's actually a loving thing that Jesus came to, and God tells us that. Why? Because he doesn't want you to experience that. Everyone's like, well, why do you talk about wrath? Because it's real. <laughs> hell's real, and God doesn't want you to go there. Why? Because he sent his son to die in your stead. Um, the cross uh, is something, uh, the cross is, is for you, uh, and the idea is that Christianity is really not about you. It, it, it's absolutely for you, though, that Jesus died. Uh, he died in our, in our stead. 1 Corinthians 15, 13 through 5 talks about the first importance of the gospel uh, which I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. It's the whole point of the Bible. Um, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. The whole idea is that God came on a rescue mission through Jesus Christ. Um, what are the benefits of substitutionary uh, atonement? Is I'm going to give you some fun theological words, and this will be part of a discussion to try to pay attention. Uh, and not only just pay attention, but experience experience them. Like, this is what Jesus, as you believe in him, so maybe you believe in Jesus, but you haven't appropriated through the word of God, the spirit of God, through, through conversation, the benefits that are yours in Jesus Christ. Propitiation, Romans uh, 3, 23 and 25, it says, for the wages are for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God uh, and are justified and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is Christ Jesus. 
whom God put forward what as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because of, because of in his divine forbearance he has passed over former sins. There's so much I want to unpack there, but I'm going to name a few. One is that, is that the propitiation is when Jesus on the cross said it's finished. So he's talking about, I have dealt with the full wrath of God that should point at sinful humanity. Like there's no more wrath of God. Why? Because Jesus paid in full what you deserve. Yeah, that's why he absorbed hell itself. Um, why? So you could have the peace of God, which we talked about Isaiah 53. Another thing that propitiation, as we just talked about there, that it says the forbearance. And the, a lot of people look at it as like, man, I'm a sinner, but it seems like God's okay with it. He's not okay with it. He, he, he wants you to repent and trust Christ, and he deals with your sins even right now through, through Christ. And he wants you to, to have that safety in Christ, fully paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. But I think some people think God just seems to be okay with you, and he's, he's not. That's why Jesus had to die. Um, you were so bad that Jesus had to die, and you will pay or Jesus will pay, and it depends on where your faith is. But if your faith is in Christ, it's paid in full. That means <laughs> that you are justified, so you become a legal, uh, legally from a sinner to a son. Why? Because um, the wrath of God was uh, paid. And to tie this in a little bit further, I, I got to move on, um, is Jesus being fully God, only God could pay, repay God. And so Jesus had to be fully God to repay a, a righteous, holy God. And so if Jesus was just a good man and he died, that would not be enough. Only, only God could satisfy the wrath of God. It, it's super important. Expiation, 1 John 1, 7 and 9. A lot of people don't know this, but it's a beautiful biblical truth and benefit of Christ. But if you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, what cleanses us, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have no sin, we deceived ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Some people carry so much guilt and shame that is not yours. There's freedom in Christ. It's called expiation. Not only does he pay the wrath of God, but he, he actually takes your sin away. God doesn't see guilt. He doesn't see, he doesn't see the shame. And so he's like, don't carry that. As far as the east of the west, that's the idea. As far as the east of the west, your sins are forgiven, and, and God doesn't see them anymore. So it's as if you've never sinned. So if you're like, you're like, yeah, God, I know Jesus dealt with the wrath of God, but you know, um, I, I still remember this. Well, I'm telling you, God doesn't even remember your sin. How amazing is that? That you don't have to feel that, 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 that condemnation. You're free from that. Uh, he carries it away. That's uh, that idea. He cleanses from all unrighteousness. Um, the gift of righteousness, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we become the righteous of God. Again, uh, he gives us his, 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 his righteousness, his position. That's why it talks about in his poverty, uh, we, we be rich. The, their idea is uh, double imputation, which is we give him our sin, our, our sin, our filth, and he gives us his righteousness. So we give him sin, and what do we get? We get his righteousness. And that's why God looks at us as he calls us sons. That's also why we do no perfect people. If you ever wonder, like, why do we always do that? That's why, because you're not perfect, but in Christ you have a righteousness. You are perfect. We want you not to cling to any righteousness of yourself, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's how we're made right. And then lastly, just our redemption. Uh, Titus 2.13 and 14, this is the power of, of, of Jesus, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself, uh, listen, for us to redeem us from the lawless and uh, to the purity for himself, a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. In Christ... Uh, it talks about we become new creations. Um, we become new creation. It talks about in Scripture that transfers, from the, uh, transfers us from the domain of darkness to the domain of light. So by the Spirit of God and the benefits of Christ, the power of Christ, we, we, can, we can live a redeemed life, walk in the light as he is in the light. It's a beautiful truth. That, that's from the power, that's a power, uh, actually, it's the power of the Holy Spirit, but the benefit of Jesus. This is what Jesus did for us on, on the cross. So that, that is a lot. I know it's a dream from a fire hydrant, but it, man, there's so much to say about the incarnation and the person of Jesus Christ. What we're going to do now is break up into groups and hopefully digest some of that. So move that mind into maybe our hearts and Lord willing into our lives. That's why we do this. 
theology on fire. We want to go into your, your mind, into your heart, and by God's grace, through your life, live it out. Uh, and we have four questions on the screen, and we'd love for you all, if someone doesn't mind reading them and discuss.